Hallo, guten Abend oder guten Tag noch. Mein Name ist Rafał Wojcik und ich habe heute die Ehre, das Webinar mitzumoderieren. Ich möchte sehr herzlich alle unsere Teilnehmer aus Deutschland, Österreich und der Schweiz herzlich begrüßen. Das Webinar wird auf Englisch durchgeführt und uh, jetzt now I would like to uh, to welcome our agile consultant and trainer Pavel Słowikowski. Hello Pavel. Good evening. Uh, nice to nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Um, the, the webinar will be recorded, uh, so there will be. Uh, a possibility to an option to return to the uh, uh, to the recording after this uh, this webinar after this evening. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the beginning, uh, um, a few words uh, about uh, vm.pl. Vm.pl was founded 2004, and since 2017, um, we have been operating on the DACH region or uh, on the German speaking uh, market. Uh, we are a leading uh, software house in Poland, which provides um, its services in the DACH region. Uh, this has been uh, appreciated, for example, not only for our customers, but also uh, by uh, such institutions as Financial Times or uh, Statista, uh, and uh, as you can see, we provide not only insuring services, but also comprehensive support for IT projects, from outlining uh, assumption, project management, to IT consulting, and whole digital uh, transformation uh, uh, projects. Of course, uh, all uh, of these uh, areas, in all of these areas, we support our clients. Uh, in order to be successful uh, in projects uh, management, uh, an appropriate uh, approach uh, to, to uh, project management is uh, really very important. And today we would like to uh, go through one of, uh, uh, I think, the best uh, approaches uh, that we uh, can um, uh, meet on the, in, in the IT. Uh, and we are going to talk about Agile. If you have any question uh, during the webinar, uh, please uh, write in the chat. We are uh, at the end. We would like to to answer all questions or comments. Uh, uh, so uh, please please do this. There will be uh, a space for for that. Uh, and now I will give uh, the floor to uh, to Pavel. Uh, Pavel, the stage is yours. Thank you, Rafael. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so once again, my name is Pavel, and I am happy to cooperate with VMPL on uh, this uh, on this topic of agility. And uh, yes, this is true that um, to have a successful project, not only a technical capability is needed, but also a way to organize or maybe even self-organize uh, the organization in such a way that it's focused on delivering value uh, to its customers. And today I will uh, talk a bit about the basics of agility, of the agile methods. This will be just a basic foundation that uh, we build upon when we say, okay, let's use agile in, in a certain environment. Uh, we'll talk about uh, what is agility, what is the agile approach. Uh, we'll talk about a bit uh, why companies decide to do it in uh, in such a way, and then uh, what are the challenges 
that companies face when trying to to adopt this mode of work and uh, also some places where agile is my, maybe not uh, the best approach uh, and in what places it is a good approach and also some real life examples some cases where uh, agile approach helped to lower the risk of a project so i'm counting on your questions uh, on anything you want to uh, dig deeper into uh, we'll have time for this today even if we don't have time i guess the questions can go um, to our parking lot and then will be answered later so starting with what is agility agile agility agility for me is um the ability of a organization or company to adapt to changing um, marketing market conditions and to changing environment and imagine a, a steady slow moving ship uh, it stays on its course and is very predictable in its schedule uh, maybe the ship the crew or the captain does not care about the waves around it because it's so big uh, you know it can just stream line its way uh, through any conditions or at least that's what we think however imagine an iceberg uh, emerging uh, doesn't have to be an iceberg can be for example uh, an island full of treasures so something different from the usual schedule that we have uh, a danger or an opportunity and um, for such a big ship it is very difficult to change direction and uh, for this organization it's all or nothing uh, the whole cargo is stored in that one ship so imagine it can be organization it can be a huge project that is just you know sailing ahead and nothing can stop it or at least that's what we think uh, if it sinks the damage will be substantial uh, to the organization or maybe even catastrophic now let's take a look at a different setup let's say we have a small sailboat or a motorboat it cannot take much cargo not certainly not as much as as the huge ship we talked about before no, but it is fast nimble and can turn quickly to avoid danger or to reach something interesting along the way and this is an agile example of an agile organization uh, moving at a fast pace and also allowing itself to change direction quickly based on the feedback it receives uh, from different sources from their customers from quality checks etc from from the market and uh, other sources stakeholders etc so uh, this this is the difference imagine not only one sailboat sailboat or a motorboat it, it can be a multiple uh, an armada of ships and so even if one of the ships the small ships will sink or fail or turn around or get lost that's okay because we still have our cargo distributed among the other ships so having just small pieces of a product or small projects small items that we work on uh, and distributing them and having them uh, be agile and be able to change direction to maneuver along the treacherous waves and uh, things at the sea will help you to actually limit the risk so it's no longer all over nothing it becomes well the exercise of aligning those boats so in order for this to work you have to have a good alignment because those boats need to go into more or less the same direction for example this north star that you have here on this picture so maybe it's easier to align this big ship 
but the risk is much greater when something goes wrong. All right, moving on. So the key element in agile approach is iterative development. This approach is maybe the opposite to what we have in classic, uh, classically managed projects. Some call them waterfall. I call it like plan-oriented projects, where you have the plan to develop everything that you have in the scope. You usually focus on developing it, you know, in phases or sometimes in sprints. But they are also kind of like phases because in the the integration happens at the end. So you have to deliver everything that uh, someone said it's uh, a must have. And in iterative development, in agile approach, we focus on delivering uh, small pieces of a product that can be integrated to the whole product. And we just grow and refine the system that we have. So at any given moment, we have something that's usable. It might be imperfect, it might be with limited usability, but it still has something. And it can provide feedback and information and new information metrics, usability uh, metrics, etc., cetera, um, that will help us to get better decisions on where to move forward, how to develop the product, how to grow this tree. Uh, so having those small portions uh, developed iteratively as we go and always having something that's that's ready, that's usable, helps us to gather f feedback frequently, change direction if needed, and uh, stop at any time and still have a product or, or something, a, a service, instead of having just a portion of it that's missing key pieces that... Uh, does not allow to use it as a whole. So that's a key point to uh, iterative development. Why would we want to actually go this road? So maybe you're familiar with Standish Group. This is a group that has been analyzing uh, software projects for about 30 years now probably over uh, 30 years now. They have over 50,000 projects in their database. They tracked their statuses, like were they successful, uh, sort of successful, like maybe challenged or did they fail? And uh, in their annual reports, and I could find this uh, recent version from 2020, they uh, a couple of years already um, before that, they state that Agile projects have a greater success rate than the Waterfall projects. And if you ask what, what what's a successful project, right? They give a certain list of criteria. So the usual ones, I'm not a fan of those criteria, the, the first three, by the way, on time, on budget and on target. But, for example, on goal, on uh, delivering value and uh, having a high user satisfaction, those are nice additions to this list. All those traditional, uh, this traditional projects triangle, the first three. And they say, okay, this um, Agile projects have a much higher success rate than the Waterfall projects. If you look at the challenged state of projects, it's more similar. And the failed rate is also smaller for Agile projects based on this huge database of projects, uh, software development projects, of course. And if you uh, dig deeper into it, uh, you can have a look at the success rate based on project size. And it seems that there is especially a difference between uh, Waterfall and Agile projects uh, in large and medium project sizes. Uh, interestingly, uh, large Agile projects succeed uh, in 19%. So it's 
much smaller than the overall success rate. But waterfall projects succeed only in 8%. And uh, medium projects, 34% for Agile, 9% for waterfall. So the biggest difference is in large and medium projects. Small projects, not so much of a difference, 55, 59 to 45%. So um, small projects may be more predictable, less complex than uh, the the. the like the benefit of agility is maybe smaller compared to uh, the classic planning based approach. There is another group measuring the state of agile. They, uh, for I think 16 years now, they send out this survey to multiple organizations uh, across the globe. Unfortunately, it's uh, a little bit biased towards the United States. Most of the respondents are from there, but it's it's changing a bit throughout the years. But they ask questions about practices and how the companies fare in their agile ways of working. And one of the questions that they ask is, uh, has the implementation of agile positively impacted each of the following areas uh, within your company? And the respondents could mark multiple answers here. Um, as you can see, this, this is rather a comprehensive list of benefits, uh, the perceived benefits. The, they're not like objective benefits, but they're perceived benefits that the respondents said that the, they improved with adopting agility. And uh, here we have, uh, I will talk about the first three maybe. So at, uh, at the top, we have a managing changing priorities. And it is made easier due to the fact that um, we freeze the scope for much shorter periods of time. So in the classical approach, we freeze the scope for months ahead. And this is say like we have the fixed scope. We cannot change anything unless, for example, we go through a change request. Uh, or, or something, and they have to be approved, etc. Right, and then in agile methodologies, we say we freeze the scope for one to three, three weeks, maybe like a sprint, and then after this sprint or iteration, we can change the priorities again. So we can handle what business is uh, asking us of. Maybe something new comes up, and uh, we need to quickly. Uh, change the order of uh, development and we can do this it's not that much of an impact it still is kind of but maybe less than we had in the classic approach then we have the explicit uh, well we have the visibility and visibility for me for example is uh, having explicit definition of done so the agreement between the business and IT to see when, so, like, what it means when we say that something is done, really done, completed. And if we have this explicitly stated and we know that, okay, it's been tested, for example, and um, deployed or um, released, etc., then we have clear visibility of the state of the work that we have. And of course, there are some other various tools that we can use uh, to visualize the work we have and to visualize the state of work, etc. But um, this, for me, like definition of done, is, is a great example of increasing visibility. Also, having small pieces of finished work is uh, the best measure, uh, the best measure of progress, not uh, having just green. Uh, traffic lights on project reports and presentations that we have and then suddenly it's read uh, a couple of days before the deadline but having real progress uh, visible due to uh, just having iterations and every iteration we, we can deliver something small and the third item on this list is business IT alignment this is supported by short and frequent feedback uh, for example when we have uh, specific frameworks that use uh, meetings like sprint review that regular meeting where we uh, where a team presents what they did and they meet with the stakeholders the business maybe even the users 
and they receive feedback on what they what they did. So uh, there is a clear um, visibility also to the business where we are, and also uh, for the business it is clear, but also for the IT uh, it is clear why something is needed and what are the priorities because the touch points are very frequent and there is also an iterative process of refining the backlog so the list of uh, ordered list of uh, requirements that connects the business and it and this frequent uh, iterative process helps to connect the problem domain with the solution domain here so that's also helping the alignment moving on by the way if you have questions as we go just don't hesitate type them on the chat we'll be addressing them as we go okay so we talked about why uh, what agility is and why we might uh, have use of it and now i will tell you about uh, a bit about where where agile might bring the most value actually and what what kind of endeavors and what kind of projects or um, activities that we have um, agile can be more beneficial in certain circumstances maybe in some less beneficial maybe less useful and here on this picture you have the stacy matrix and it has two dimensions one uh, on the y-axis is the agreement or certainty of requirements so how are we sure that this is what we want to achieve and what is the agreement between stakeholders regarding this and on the x-axis we have technology so uh, what's the complexity of the technology what's the relation between the the cause and the effect is is this a technology we we know uh, is it something that's familiar to us or maybe to the right side it's something that we have to discover maybe it's unknown when we have no information no skills maybe related to it and uh as you can see here, we have five zones based on those two dimensions. And the first one is the, the simple domain, the simple zone, where everything is clear, technology is known, and the, the requirements are clear. This is like a, a factory production. So for example, uh, this is like producing uh, 10,000 bottles that you know the, the parameters are all set and then the, the uh, factory assembly line just produces those bottles this is something like uh, baking 100 loaves of bread when you already have the recipe right and the ingredients then we have the uh, the number two is socially complicated domain this is interesting because we assume that the technology is known but there is little agreement regarding or maybe less agreement regarding the requirements so this is, might be something like uh, for example uh, we want to like rewrite something from one technology to a, to another but maybe there's uh, this new technology is is known it's uh, familiar to us etc but maybe we uh, don't have clear agreement where to start first with which system for example we want to start the migration etc so this will require some sort of iterative approach where we negotiate the the scope with the stakeholders and then we have uh, the third domain which is technically complicated and uh, so this is the opposite so more or less the requirements are firm and secure but the technology might be like unknown we have little skill in it maybe 
this is something we're discovering and here the approach would be uh, scenarios planning strategic planning and maybe um, technical proof of concepts so for example in this domain i could give you an example that uh, one of my one of my teams uh, had to also like we had a clear um, functionality to to rewrite like a backend server and uh, so the requirements were known and uh, there were a couple of technologies that they wanted to check first like the the server was uh, running on c++ i think and then they wanted to rewrite it to something else and they had a couple of technologies to check so we had like a uh like a extended hackathon with a couple of days checking different uh technologies where uh, like developers just did a couple of uh, proof of concepts and uh, they assessed the uh, positives and negatives of each technology all right and then we have the zone of complexity number four this is where agile methods and agile mindset is the most beneficial so you can see this is a pretty wide zone and it uh, encompasses like both unknown technology and vague requirements so this is uh, basically where uh, agile makes more sense most sense is for example checking market fit of a new product um, maybe we want to check how it might fare we want to maybe produce something small maybe we don't even code at first but you know we can inspect and adapt get feedback quickly uh, researching a prototype so that we can later productize it uh, trying to change user habits we don't know what will work but we have some hypothesis and then we check small things okay is this working not okay let's check something else assessing uh, usability of certain features uh, same thing every, every time we get quick feedback we measure things we see whether this is um, providing value and is usable or not checking viability of new technology discovering an uh, like a different way to solve a complex problem uh, this is especially true like for software development where we have some kind of unknown field to map or maybe a functionality that we cannot just copy from other product we need to solve some some uh, some problem in a different way that's been already solved and so you can see like the, the frequent thing is here feedback agile excels in all those places where we need frequent and quick feedback in order to get us information so that we can make better decisions to whether to change direction this way or that way or scrap what we're doing and stop it and do something else quickly so in those places that's perfect approach uh not everywhere the full benefit of agile will be present for example having a um, fixed scope project like a list of must-have requirements uh, split into smaller pieces like milestones or iterations um, to be delivered in a fixed time will probably not utilize the uh, agile approach to to the like the most extent uh, this is usually the case I see in, in some sort of uh, safe implementations. Safe is a scaled agile framework or uh, like we have a project and the only agile thing about it is that we split it into, into sprints, but it's still the same, like very much waterfall style approach just with iterations. But, you know, even in this kind of projects, we still can uh, lower the uh, certain risks and I will show you how to do it on the next slide so this is a picture I uh, I did uh, when well kind of tweaked it a bit but uh, I worked in a, a certain organization and I mapped 
a certain project there and how the team or teams approached to do it. So this was a project where there was a, a backend part of a certain product that needed to be migrated to from one old technology no longer supported to a new version of that technology. And um, even if it was only just the backend side that had the most work to be done, then uh, some changes on the front end side also had to be done. So the front end team and back end team worked separately uh, as separate teams. That's unfortunately a common theme in many organizations, this kind of component teams. And so they met together, they sat together and they decided on a contract. So what kind of um, changes there will be on the backend side and how the front end needs to adapt to that. And they just split their ways and they started to work separately. And backend had, for example, two week sprints, front end team had a one week sprint. And the front end team finished their changes pretty early. They tested their solution on uh, the mocked data, so like a uh, um, faked um, backend side data, and they said, okay, it works, we're done. And then backend side just continued with their sp sprinting because they had a lot of more work to do. To do. Um, so it was not a small project, not a really small experiment, but like they wanted to really rewrite some huge piece of uh, the system. And then uh, suddenly they decided, okay, let's maybe after a couple of months check with the front end how like is this still working? So let's do some end-to-end -end testing. And guess what? It didn't work so well. <clears throat> so basically it turned out that the, the contract changed. Mm -hmm that there are some additional changes needed on the front end. And suddenly, uh, the, the, only the end-to-end -end testing with the real backend showed this, this kind of situation. So as you can see, the, the risk on the top side of the slide, the risk was steadily increasing with this kind of waterfall with iteration setup because the teams were separate and uh, they really didn't know whether their product is working end-to-end. And only after they started to integrate again, they saw that there are some problems. And then after that, they, they saw this and they decided, okay, let's move together from now on. Let's uh, work closely. Let's uh, plan our sprints together. Let's synchronize. Let's uh, have common testing environments and quickly uh, deploy changes, retest them, do some uh, automated regressions, etc., and uh, yeah, suddenly the the risk was decreasing because the the changes became smaller and smaller and more frequent, and they uh, had something working. Maybe they didn't break the changes that they had before when uh, constantly integrating. So uh, they managed to change their the kind of waterfall setup into a more agile approach. Probably ideally would be that there was uh, uh, just a cross-functional team, backend plus frontend, and they uh, would work together for this specific project. But yeah, at least they decided to do this um, at some point to work closely together. Um, so it is easy to fall in this trap that if the project scope is well defined, that we can work separately, component teams, and uh, agree to what, like when, where we want to meet in the end, and that in integration should go smoothly because we agreed, because we signed off contracts, papers, etc. But this is rarely the case, as we know, and this is where agile approach can help you to limit this risk. To, to find out about problems late, even if in such a such a fixed scope project. Um, and this is more of, uh, of the same, uh, but from another angle, 
it um, it cannot be overstated in my opinion that agile can also lower the budgeting risk for for your organization because if we assume that we should have frequent releases of something that is working that's been tested that's uh, at least is somehow usable maybe imperfect then we can not only change direction and uh, you know build trust with stakeholders and get feedback faster but we can also fail fast meaning that if the business side or the sponsors of the project say that uh, they see that for example this is not not the way not it's not bringing any value that or maybe not enough value that we assume it will bring we can just cut it and if we cut the project at some point we should at least have something that we developed and maybe can be useful later maybe but it's at least some chance a bigger chance than we had in waterfall projects where we could for example run out of money at, at some point and we didn't have anything because it wasn't for example integrated tested or something so we had a huge base of code that was just we didn't know where it worked um, i remember uh, one time i was working with uh, a small team that was developing a mobile app for a customer uh, i was working in a software house this was a team in a software house and we developed this for a client and um, so instead of releasing frequently something that is imperfect and getting feedback and pushing it to the customer we uh, spend a lot of time perfecting the technology we try to get this this really like according to specs and really high quality uh you know unit tests everything and um and at some point we just uh got the message from uh from our client that they run out of money and we didn't have anything to just just you know spend so much time like adding some small features and perfecting them that we just forgot about releasing early and even something that might be usable uh, so we missed the chance uh, all right as in any change and uh, adopting agile is, is a huge change there are some challenges and uh, moving towards agility is uh, much more than just starting to work in sprints and having daily meetings in software development teams it usually is an organization-wide effort and uh, well brings resistance brings problems along the way so again this is the uh, result of the, the can show you the answers to the question of what are the most significant barriers to adopting and scaling agile projects and uh, practices in your current organizations from the 15th state of agile report and we have here at the top three uh, first inconsistent processes uh, that is that is often the case for example, when we give autonomy to the teams, th there has to be a balance between standardization of processes and practices uh, with uh, the autonomy and freedom to choose their, their own way of working. If we have different, very different approaches, like here we have like one week sprints, here we have two week sprints, this, this can be difficult to align and, for example, to understand what is really done, like if they have different definitions of done that's that's uh, difficult and then we have the organizational culture at odds with agile values this is tricky um very subjective organizational culture is often the slowest to change because it consists of values behaviors and habits of all the people especially the leaders and it's easy to introduce mechanical changes in it and not see the, um, the the management style also needs to adjust if this is not happening an agile uh, will be only superficial uh, like just just a thin layer of mechanical um, meetings and roles uh, just like a flavor on top 
And the third item, the general organization resistance to change. Uh, this is uh, always, for me, it's different from person to person. There's always a reason for to resist something. We have our needs, we have our uh, safety level, uh, the needs to uh, maybe do our job well. We knew how to do our job before the change and now we're, it's, it's different. So it creates resistance, it creates uncertainty. And uh, during the shift towards agility, I find that um, usually the, the management, especially the middle management, is the group that is the, in the toughest spot, might provide the biggest resistance because uh, frequently they encounter the most fierce pushback from the lower management and the teams themselves that uh, want to be self-organized now and don't don't want to be controlled as much and at the same time they receive the push from the top management uh, c level where uh, the the c level wants for things to be the same as they were they ha want to have the same kind of reporting and deadlines etc so now the middle man management is pushed between those two layers and it's a tough spot to be in and yeah this might generate resistance and that's that's natural that's normal all right a couple more challenges um, especially for the scaling part so it's difficult enough to uh, to change to towards agility if you, if you have a stable environment and maybe a stable amount of people you want to to make this change with but it's much more complex and difficult when the company is growing uh, because if you don't fix your problems and you don't standardize your processes, don't fix your bottlenecks, don't, don't visu visualize your work, make it more transparent, address some um, basic issues like, for example, technical capability to release frequently, then if you just scale it, and it, it will not work. You, if you have poor processes in the beginning, you, you scale it and you get just more of the same. So uh, this is uh, this is a thing I, I encounter very frequently with organizations where you know, the, just adding people, we have more work, we need more people, new roles. If we have a, uh, a problem, then we hire a person that gets a role to fix the problem, right? And then they create their own structure and and the next department springs up and then we have even more people and more complex uh, environment, more dependencies between the teams. And uh, this just scales in the wrong direction. So uh, I would be careful with having this agile transformation uh, and and scaling at the same time. Also, something to be wary of is when adopting agility is a local improvements. So I've seen it also, I've done it also myself. I remember a time where like maybe even, uh, was it like 10 or nine years ago already? I worked in a, in a team that was part of a like 20 team program and we experimented with Kanban, limiting working progress, uh, measuring lead times. It was great. We managed to shorten the fixed time for defects from like 70 days to about two weeks. That was amazing for us. But at the same time, it did not matter in the whole picture because the release that contained those fixes, the was about to go to our customers was every half a year so even if we optimize the time locally it didn't matter in the in this like the whole system approach so i'm not saying not to um, focus also on individuals growing them helping to enable their skills etc and helping the teams locally to improve but in my experience most of the the biggest benefits uh, to increase efficiency, effectiveness, is when we address the system changes, so system problems, bottlenecks, 
we'll first visualize those problems and then we fix them one by one instead of focusing on just having the teams for example to better plan or estimate their their tasks so in the end is agile for you that's the question you need to answer for yourself uh, here are the couple of uh, guidelines from myself um, I would say that Agile is for anyone, but not for everyone. So not in every single instance, Agile will bring you the most benefits. Sometimes the cost of transforming to, to this model work will be just higher than the potential benefits. If you cannot change some other things, like solve those systemic problems or um, like get a better technical capability to to de deploy fast to gather frequent feedback etc or if you plan only to do it locally in it or, or not planning to change the mindset of management and other parts of the organization that, that then that you might spend a lot of money on um on trainings and on consultants but you will not get the most out of it so, but if you you're willing to to open up and learn something different, or even if you know agile or you think you know agile ways of working, then if you want to uh, address those difficult problems that the organization might have, focus on not only on local improvements but on the whole value stream, budgeting, resources, etc., getting feedback from the customers, then this might work for you. Uh, things that will help? Uh, well, definitely support from experienced people, but uh, maybe not just two days trainings uh, with certificates, but someone who actually can work with you, along with you, and you know get to know your real problems that you have. Systemic approach, as mentioned before, so this, this kind of end-to-end -end, uh, value stream approach, like, okay, wh what, what, what's the piece of uh, value that we can deliver end-to-end? -end? What, what's the smallest piece? And then we focus on it and improve the flow of it. Then growing the leaders and investing in soft skills that will definitely help to, to be more agile and not just mechanically agile. All right. That's it from me. Uh, hi again, Baron. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, very valuable input uh, to this webinar. Um, I have a question. Uh, you taught us uh, today a lot of about uh, advantages of agile, and uh, what do you think? What what is the biggest risk of uh, of this approach of agile? That's an interesting question. My. What's the biggest risk? The biggest risk, in my opinion, is to have some sort of a mechanical partial approach implemented locally in software development teams. If uh, if only the, the the team members are uh, enabled in this kind of approach, because they this this is like an actual risk that you teach people locally in the teams like how they can work how they can be motivated they how can they self-organize be autonomous and uh, not just be uh they're just the same like coding monkeys right but have being a partner to the business and then if you don't do it on the business side on on the rest of the organization then you might just lose those people because they will find out, hey, this is a cool way of working. And then if the rest of the organization is not following, then, well, maybe I should look for another organization to do it with. <laughs> and, and the second que question is, what is the biggest fear of moving to Agile? Um, Changing the way of thinking, the mindset? Depends 
depends from on person to person, right? So for for some people, I know some people that are that really thrive in this kind of high um like stress environment where they do a lot of things at once and they think that they're when they're busy then they're efficient or effective they're usually not and agile approaches for example okay focus do less things at a time provide some slack time and this might be fearful for those people like uh for some people like uh having this much of transparency and communication with other other team members other people some some i know people that just want to have a task assigned to them and they just want to do it until it's done and mm -hmm. here you have a lot of communication a lot of transparency hey how are you like uh, uh can i help you with this task can we pair do pair programming etc right so this is this is something that might be fearful so it depends uh, the question um, we got in the chat how properly manage dependencies in agile way is there a recommended solution which would work in most cases um well actually yes <laughs> i have one recommended solution that should work in most cases remove dependencies by creating teams that can uh, deliver pieces of uh, product or they can focus on an area or a product that uh, can deliver end-to-end -end pieces of this area or a product. So, the, like, will it always work? No. But if it's possible, I would advise this, like, for example, this back-end front-end example, it's clearly a dependency, like someone is waiting for someone. Imagine a team where we have back-end and front-end representatives together in one team then we don't have these dependencies between teams. Uh, so I would say if it's possible, just remove the root cause of the dependency. Um, and if you really need to manage the, those dependencies, well, there are tools to visualize it in, in Jira, for example, and some kind of uh, roadmaps, advanced roadmaps, big picture, add-ons to Jira. But you know, in the end, it's always like, you, you can either play with those tools and manage dependencies, or you can really tackle the difficult topics, the root cause of those dependencies. This will be more difficult, but will bring you more value in the end. Uh, do you think Agile is, uh, is a way of uh, um, mitigate uh, human mistakes? I have never received this question before. <laughs> Mitigate human mistakes. Well, if we have a look at the, like, if we say about like quality, right? So then I would say yes and no. <laughs> no, because uh, humans will always make mistakes and yes to some extent it will mitigate those like maybe lower the impact of those mistakes because they will be found quicker and earlier in the process and thus will be probably less expensive to fix so we have a lot of corporations like you know pair programming all, all those engineering practices that are also part of agile approach and then we have the quick integration tests and uh, you know all the cycle is much more frequent than in the classical approach so i would say yeah, it will lower the impact of those mistakes mm -hmm. uh, and i think last question uh, you've mentioned that it's difficult to introduce agile into a company that is scaling what about the company that is uh, stagnant uh, where the team doesn't know the methodology and it is afraid of such changes, how to implement it in such a case, where to start? I would start with the sponsors, the, 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 the management, uh, because there are many 
instances where we can do a bottom-up approach in in um, like introducing small experiments uh, on the team level and then showing this this kind of the new approach can work but without the support of the the, the key stakeholders this will not not work this will not just propagate uh, so i would start with talking to the to the key stakeholders in this organization and asking them about uh, what kind of problems they have what kind of challenges uh, what, what's not working? What 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 do you uh, what kind of problems you're facing? And then not say that hey, agile is a solution for you. Here we have something that will surely help. But I would just address those points one by one, and use agile methods in the background to, for example, increase visibility, uh, maybe shorten the feedback loop, etc. Great, uh, Pavel. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, for sharing your knowledge today with us. Um, thank you for uh, all participants of today's uh, webinar. If you uh, if the topic of today's meeting uh, uh, inspired you, uh, please contact me. Uh, let's talk about uh, agile approach. Uh, Let's talk about implementing Agile, improving Agile uh, in your companies. Uh, for today, I would like to thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, your time. Thank you once again, Pavel, for, uh, for joining uh, the webinar today. And uh, I hope to, uh, to meet you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Good evening to all of you.